Hello and welcome back to Count to 10. In today's mini pod, we're going to cover the neuromuscular junction and succimethonium. I'm recording this on the 15th of August, and as one of my bosses used to say at work, there's a certain feeling in the air when it's primary day. I'm wishing all the candidates the best of luck, and I hope that your hard work pays off. There's nothing that quite describes the anxiety you feel going into the primary exam, but the relief you feel after it as well. So I hope today's questions were kind to you and you got the questions you wanted. And I recommend that all candidates take at least one to two weeks off just to mellow out and relax and reset. With that said, today's mini pod is gonna follow the same structure going through our basic understanding and physiology. Then we'll look at the past SAQs related to these two topics and then some of the opening viva stems. This again is a core topic that we use on a day-to-day basis. So good fundamental knowledge of the neuromuscular junction and succimethonium is key to our everyday practice. And with that said, let's dive straight in. The neuromuscular junction can be simply described as a chemical bridge between the motor neuron and the skeletal muscle. It consists of three specific components. Firstly, there's the unmyelinated prejunctional nerve terminal ending. Usually these are your fast A-alpha neurons, but sometimes can be slow A-delta neurons as well that you might see in places like your intraocular muscles, your intrinsic laryngeal muscles, and your facial muscles. The second component is your post-junctional motor end plate or vasculetal muscle. These are folded in a specific way and house both acetylcholine receptors at the peaks and acetylcholinesterases among the clefts. Finally, we have the synaptic cleft itself, which is a small 20 nanomillimeter space, which contains ECF, and this is the so-called bridge that acetylcholine needs to cross to reach its motor end plate. To understand the neuromuscular junction well, I've broken it up into three specific sections. Firstly, looking at acetylcholine itself in terms of synthesis, metabolism, and release. Secondly, looking at the pathway of the action potential from the prejunctional nerve terminal ending to the creation of the action potential within the skeletal muscle. And then finally, a better look at the acetylcholine receptors itself, their types, and their structure. So starting off with acetylcholine, this is an abundant neurotransmitter that's located in the entire parasympathetic nervous system, in the preganglionic sympathetic nervous system, and some post, especially in the adrenal medulla and the sweat gland, parts of our central nervous system, and then importantly for us today, the somatic nerve endings innervating the neuromuscular junction. It's a quaternary ammonium ester, and importantly, when you hear the word quaternary, it usually means a substance that can't cross a blood-brain barrier. So another example of this would be the difference between atropine and glycopyrrolate, atropine being a tertiary structure that can cross the blood-brain barrier, and glyco being a quaternary structure. To synthesize acetylcholine, we need two things. We need acetylcoenzyme A and choline. It's simple when you just think of the name of the structure. Choline itself comes from diet, liver synthesis, and is recycled from the breakdown of other acetylcholine molecules. While acetylcoenzyme A comes from the mitochondria, when pyruvate joins with coenzyme A, and this reaction is catalyzed by pyruvate dehydrogenase. When we take these two components, the choline and the acetyl-CoA, we have a specific enzyme that makes acetylcholine. This is choline acetyltransferase, and another byproduct of this reaction is the production of coenzyme A. Now, just like we synthesize something, we need a way to break it down. And in this case, the metabolism occurs by acetylcholinesterases. These are located in our synaptic clefts of our motor end plate, and they have a specific anionic and esteratic site. I'm not going to talk about those sites today, but they play an important role for reversing the action of neuromuscular drugs. The breakdown product of acetylcholine is choline itself and acetate. Within the unmyelinated prejunctional nerve terminals, Acetylcholine is housed in vesicles, with one vesicle storing approximately 10,000 acetylcholine molecules. 
To put that into context, one action potential releases 200 vesicles in one go. Now let's look at how that release actually occurs. To start off, we have the unmyelinated prejunctional nerve terminals. Here, an action potential has been propagated down through opening of voltage-gated sodium channel, and it's coming to the end of the nerve. At this terminal, there's an increase in the amount of voltage-gated calcium channels that are located, and these are activated as the resting membrane potential becomes more positive at minus 45 millivolts. The effect of this is a calcium influx into the nerve terminal, and the calcium binds to the vesicles that house the acetylcholine. This starts a reaction where those vesicles move to the membrane of the nerve terminal and are released via a process called the exocytosis. As those ACH molecules go into the synaptic cleft, some of them will go and make it across the synaptic cleft, binding to acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate. Some of them will be broken down before they can even make the journey, and some of them will go back and bind to presynaptic acetylcholine receptors located on the prejunctional nerve terminals themselves, creating a positive feedback loop that releases more acetylcholine vesicles. When we concentrate at the motor end plate, we have acetylcholine receptors. Essentially, the activation of these leads to ion influx. Typically, these ions are calcium, sodium, and potassium. And just like a normal action potential, the influx of these causes the resting membrane potential to increase and creates a very unique action potential to the motor end plate, referred to as a miniature end plate potential. This is a key term to know, and the generation of this miniature end plate potential is what propagates an action potential to go down and activate the skeletal muscle itself. The miniature end plate potential acts as a way for the threshold of neighboring voltage-gated sodium channels to be activated. As those voltage-gated sodium channels become activated, an action potential is carried across, going down the T-tubule, causing calcium release from the sacroplasmic reticulum, which leads to cascading events that we won't talk about in detail here, but involve things like troponin, tropomyosin, actin, and myosin. This is what causes the muscle to contract, and the summation of these miniature end plate potential is the key step for a muscle contraction to occur. Without that creation of the miniature end plate potential, the neighboring voltage-gated sodium channels won't be activated and nothing will occur. Now, when we describe this system, we typically say it's a high fidelity system. What I mean by that is that when we get ACH release into the synaptic cleft, we want to be sure that an action potential will be activated in the skeletal muscle and a muscle contraction will occur. Now, to ensure this, we have a very high margin of safety. With every activation, we get way more acetylcholine release than we need to create an action potential. And the reason for this is twofold. Firstly, as described earlier, not all of that acetylcholine will reach the postjunctional motor end plate. Really, we only need 10% of acetylcholine receptors to be activated to produce that miniature end plate potential so that skeletal muscle action potential can occur. At the same time, when we typically cause a muscle to contract, we're not just making it contract once, we're doing repeated contractions. With that, the production of acetylcholine is not as fast as its demand. So if you can imagine, if we didn't have enough ACH release, our muscle contraction would not occur, and that muscle would fatigue or not contract over time. As a consequence, we have this high margin of safety that's inbuilt, so that transmission is not affected. And this is why when we talk about neuromuscular blocking drugs, specifically our non-depolarizing agents, we need 70% of those acetylcholine receptors to be blocked until we see some impairment of muscle function. So this is a really cool and nerdy safety mechanism that our body has developed over time. Now, let's look at those acetylcholine receptors in detail. The easiest way to classify acetylcholine receptors is either nicotinic or muscarinic. Muscarinic receptors are typically G-protein coupled receptors, and as you can imagine, a G-protein coupled receptor needs to act slowly for the action to occur, because there's a lot of intermediary steps that happen in activation of that G-protein coupled receptor. On the other hand, nicotinic receptors typically rely on a ligand channel being opened, so their action is fast 
and this is what we need in the neuromuscular junction. There are two types of nicotinic receptors, appropriately named N1 and N2. N1 is in the pre- and postsynaptic areas of the neuromuscular junction, and they can be located both presynaptically, postsynaptically, or extrajunctionally. While N2 are primarily postsynaptic receptors that are located within the autonomic nervous system ganglia, the adrenal medulla, and they're typically for efferent transmission. The structure of a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is key to know. It's a pentameric structure, pentameric meaning that it has five subunits. These are 2 alpha, 1 beta, 1 delta, and 1 epsilon. And when you have an epsilon subunit, it's referred to as an adult nicotinic receptor. When that epsilon subunit is changed to a gamma subunit, this is referred to as a fetal nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. The difference is the fetal nicotinic acetylcholine receptors stay open for longer because they have a prolonged open channel state. And the implication is that a single action potential that activates a fetal nicotinic acetylcholine receptor can cause a prolonged skeletal muscle action potential. And that prolonged action potential can lead to a sustained potassium release from muscles. So overall, within the neuromuscular junction, there are three types of acetylcholine receptors. Two located postsynaptically and one located presynaptically. The two postsynaptically are one, the junctional acetylcholine receptors, and these are typically your adult nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Then we have extrajunctional acetylcholine receptors, mainly in the fetal form. The clinical implication of knowing these receptors is what upregulates them and downregulates them. The upregulation of fetal acetylcholine receptors occurs whenever there's a degree of stasis. What I mean by this is that they're upregulated when the neuromuscular junction is not being activated. So in conditions like paraplegia, especially in the first six months, we're at high risk. In conditions like a stroke, multiple sclerosis, or Guillain-Barre syndrome. And then the one that we get worried about is burns typically after the first 48 hours. And these can be upregulated for a period of 9 to 18 months, depending on what text you read. The implication of these is very simple. Activation of these fetal acetylcholine receptors leads to that long action potential and this sustained potassium release that can be fatal in cases. The last type of acetylcholine receptor is our presynaptic acetylcholine receptor. This one is also pentameric, but has a different configuration. And its main role is to get some of the acetylcholine that's released from our unmyelinated prejunctional nerve terminal that then binds to the presynaptic acetylcholine receptor and creates a positive feedback loop that releases more acetylcholine. Blocking of these is thought to be a mechanism by which fade occurs when we give non-depolarizing agents. So that's the neuromuscular junction in a nutshell. And let's just talk about some simple definitions. The first term is non-depolarizing block. This refers to a competitive block where there's no fasciculation seen. Typically with this type of block, you see a fade. The second term you have to know is depolarizing block. This is sometimes referred to as a phase one block, and it's a non-competitive block where you classically see fasciculations. There's no fade. There's no post-tetanic potentiation and the block is augmented by anticholinesterases. This is typically seen with succinmethonium, and if you give too much succinmethonium, you progress to the next definition, which is a phase two block. The exact mechanism of the phase two block is still unknown, but it's thought to be a desensitization of those post-junctional receptors, which leads to a transition from phase one to phase two. Essentially, you move towards the characteristics of a non-depolarizing block, so you see that fade and a decrease in your train of fall ratio. The last term is a desensitization block. This differs from a phase two block and it's thought to occur as a safety mechanism to prevent over excitation of the neuromuscular junction. With this, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors become insensitive to the channel opening effects of agonists such as succinmethonium. Typically, when you describe this state, you say that the receptor is in a constant flux between open and closed. The importance of knowing these different terms is that sometimes they're just asked as a one-off in a viva setting, 
So you just need a quick way to differentiate between these types of definitions. Moving on now, we're going to look at succimethonium. Now this is the first time in the podcast that we've actually covered a drug. And so when you cover a drug for the first time, you need a structured way to do so. The classic way is looking at the pharmaceutics of the drug, the pharmacodynamics of the drug, which includes its mechanism of action, the drug dosage, and the effect on each body system. Then you look at the pharmacokinetics, broken down into the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And finally, you can look at the toxic effect of the drugs. So what I'll do now is go through the structure of succimethonium. Then when we go and look at the past SAQs, we'll really focus on the toxic effects because that seems to be the most repeated SAQ. So to describe succimethonium, we can say that it is a clear colorless solution of succimethonium chloride. It comes as a 50 milligram per mil solution and it's usually stored at four degrees. The chemical structure is a diacetylcholine structure which simply means that it's two acetylcholine molecules bound together via acetate methyl group. The mechanism of action is technically a non-competitive partial agonist at the post-junctional acetylcholine receptor. The unique thing about sucks compared to acetylcholine is that it only needs to bind to one of those subunits on those receptors to activate that receptor. Unlike acetylcholine itself that needs to bind to both of those alpha subunits, for activation of that channel. When succimethonium binds to the channel, you get a prolonged activation of that channel because there's no way to break down the succimethonium within the neuromuscular junction. Succimethonium is typically broken down by plasma colonisterases and these aren't present in the neuromuscular junction. So you get a sustained opening of the ion channel which generates the miniature end plate potential this generation of the miniature end plate potential creates a persistent depolarization which activates the nearby voltage gated sodium channels and this is really key to understand. That activation of that voltage gated sodium channel leads to that initial action potential which is why you see the contraction and fasciculations occur when you give succimethonium. But because there's sustained depolarization there's an initiation of what's called a local current circuit. And essentially what's happening is you're preventing the resetting of those voltage gated sodium channels to be activated again. It's very similar to giving local anesthetic and blocking it in its inactivated state so that further action potentials cannot be propagated. And that is where SUX is doing majority of its work. Without creating that local current circuit, it wouldn't be an effective muscular blocking drug. Typically a dose is less than two milligrams per kilogram you get that classic phase one block, but with repeated doses or doses higher than that, you get a transition to the phase two block as described before. The route and dose of administration can be either IV or IM. And with neuromuscular drugs, we describe this concept of ED95. This is the same as ED50, which is the effective dose for 50% of the population. But the ED95 describes the effective dose of 50% of the population to achieve a 95% reduction in a single twitch height at the adductor pollicis. The ED95 for sucks is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, and the typical dose IV is 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram. The IM dose is double that at 4 milligrams per kilogram. Its onset is pretty reliable between 30 to 60 seconds and its offset is variable between three minutes to 12 minutes. When we look at the PK data for succimethonium, we can say that the absorption is either IV or IM as described. Interestingly enough, only 20% of the drug actually reaches the neuromuscular junction because majority of it is broken down by plasma colonisterases and hydrolyzed before it even gets to that area. The distribution of this drug is very similar to other neuromuscular blocking drugs. It's a very water soluble drug so the protein binding is low at 30%, the volume of distribution is low at 0.25 liters per kilogram, and it's rapidly distributed out of the neuromuscular junction via concentration gradient. The metabolism of succimethonium is unique in that it's metabolized by plasma colonisterases, and the important thing to note is these are outside the neuromuscular junction. So as that sux gets broken down outside the neuromuscular junction, a concentration gradient is created to drive that succimethonium out of the neuromuscular junction. And that's usually a key point that people want to know in a viva that you understand 
how SUX is actually broken down. When we look at the specifics, SUX is broken down into two phases. Firstly, we have the succinyl monocholine and choline itself, which is weakly active, which is further broken down into succinic acid and another choline molecule. The elimination of SUX is mainly due to its metabolism. Because majority of the drug is metabolized, only 10% of the drug is excreted in the urine unchanged. It has a half-life beta of 3 to 5 minutes, and its hydrolysis rate is anywhere between 3 to 7 milligrams per liter per minute. Now, to further go into the metabolism of succinmethonium, we have to take a deeper look at plasma colonisterase activity. There's two ways in which plasma colonisterase activity can be affected. The first is via genetic variability, and the second is via an acquired deficiency. In terms of genetic variability, there are four alleles identified on chromosome 3 that affect the plasma colonisterase. Now, any one person has two of these alleles in their body. The four alleles are a normal allele, an atypical one, a silent one, and a fluoride resistant. 96% of the population is homozygous for the normal allele, 4% of that population is heterozygous for a normal allele, and then one of those variants. Typically, when you're heterozygous with a normal allele, the block can be prolonged anywhere between 10 minutes to 30 minutes. It's when you get into that small subset of the population that has the alleles for reduced efficiency of the plasma colonisterases, that's when the effect of succinmethonium can last hours. The classic test to see which allele a person has is a dibucane test. Dibucane is an amide local anaesthetic that inhibits normal plasma colonisterases. It's less effective at inhibiting the variant genes, so that you're silent, you're atypical, and you're fluoride resistant. And a dibucane number on this test refers to the percentage of inhibition of plasma colonisterase activity. So the higher the percentage, the more the person has a normal allele. So a normal dibucane number is 80, which refers to 80% reduced activity. And this is what you would see in a person that had homozygous normal alleles. In contrast, if someone had homozygous atypical alleles, their dibucane number would be 20%. And this is as much as I'm going to talk about with genetic variability of plasma colonisterases. The other way they can be affected is via an acquired deficiency. So typically you see this in patients that might be pregnant, have a liver disease, renal failure, cardiac failure, thyrotoxicosis. All these conditions can lead to a decreased level of plasma colonisterase activity. A common MCQ that comes up relating to this is what drugs do we give that decrease plasma colonisterase activity? So the options are metoclopramide, ketamine, the oral contraceptive pill, cytotoxic agents, drugs like neostigmine, and lithium. Typically when you get these MCQs, the answer is usually metoclopramide, but any of those options would also be correct. Now this first section of the mini pod went for a bit longer than expected, but there was a lot to cram in regarding the neuromuscular junction and succinmethonium. So now let's look at some of the past SAQs. An SAQ that I quickly want to touch upon that we just discussed was asked in 2020, which was, outline the possible reasons for prolonged paralysis induced by an IV dose of 1 mg per kilogram of succinmethonium. Now we just went through this question and the examiner report was specific in that they wanted to know the pharmacology of succinmethonium in terms of the dose, the duration, and why this is the normal dose, looking for reasons for the prolonged block, which can be separated out into qualitative reasons, quantitative reasons, and drug factors, and then a bit of detail about the plasma colonisterase itself. Now, if you're answering this question, it's very simple and straightforward. You would have a brief starting statement about how succinmethonium works, what the dose of the drug is, and how long you expect the dose to work, given its metabolism by plasma colonisterases. If we're being specific, the specific plasma colonisterase that breaks down succinmethonium is butyryl colonisterase. And I don't think you get marked down if you can't remember that, but it's just a nice thing to have in the back of your head. The way the examiner report lays out the structure is exactly the way I would do it. I would talk about the qualitative deficiencies. So these are your genetic factors. And this is when we talk about the four alleles, when we have a normal homozygous pair, a heterozygous pair with a normal allele, and then one of the variants. And then when we have a homozygous pair with some kind of variant, whether that's atypical, silent, or fluoride resistant.
Depending on the text you read, sometimes they refer to the absent one as atypical, but some of the model answers have it as an absent type. Then when you look at the quantitative factors, you can think about all the pathological factors such as your liver disease, your heart failure, your thyrotoxicosis, and you can think of all your normal physiological causes such as pregnancy having less plasma cholinesterases. Then to complete the answer, you have the effects of drugs, and you would just rattle off all the drugs that we spoke about that can affect plasma cholinesterases. A simple one that I always miss is the anticholinesterase inhibitor group, so drugs such as your neostigmine, but then also include all your other less likely drugs like your metoclopramide and your ketamine and your oral contraceptive pill. Now let's move on and get to the main question that gets asked all the time with succinimethonium. This is, what are the potential adverse effects of succinimethonium? This question was last asked in 2022. Despite the reasonable pass rates in the previous years, it gets asked multiple times and that's because it's a high knowledge question that we must know. Now you can answer this question any way you like. If you're a systems type person, you can go through each body system and then think of the side effects related to each one of those. Or if you're an acronym person or a mnemonic person, you can use the mnemonic MARKET, which stands for M being muscle pain, A being apnea, R being rise in pressures, K being potassium, E being ectopics or arrhythmias, T being temperature, and then an additional point being H being hypersensitivity. You could do that with the A and say apnea and anaphylaxis to make it easier. Regardless of the way you answer this question, you need to include all those points. So if anyone asked you what's the main side effect of succinimethonium, don't say malignant hypothermia. The most common side effect of giving this drug is myalgia. Its incidence is 50% and it's typically in females who are middle age who have early mobilization after surgery. The mechanism of this is thought to be muscle fiber damage from fasciculations and the treatment for this has limited evidence but pre-treatment with giving a non-depolarizing muscle blocker can limit this incidence, giving a benzodiazepine like diazepam or giving dantrolene, aspirin or vitamin C have all got variability in their evidence base. The next thing to think about when you think of muscles is then think about masseter jaw rigidity and this can be transiently increased due to the skeletal muscle contraction. It can be a precursor to someone having malignant hypothermia or independent of malignant hypothermia. Classically, you see this in children where you can't open the jaw once you give them a bolus of succinimethonium. Then we can talk about apnea, and we've discussed this already in terms of the variability of plasma cholinesterase in butyl cholinesterases. And with this, we can include anaphylaxis. So succinimethonium is the neuromuscular drug that has the highest rate of anaphylaxis, and it's quoted to be approximately 1 in 2000. The other unique thing when you think about anaphylaxis is the drug actually releases histamine when you give it, so it can make things like bronchospasm worse. Then we talk about the rise in pressures. So there's really three pressures that we're concerned about with sucks, and this is typically due to the fasciculations that occur. The first pressure is a rise in the intra-abdominal pressures as well as a rise in the intragastric pressure. Now what these clinically do is that they both kind of negate each other there's no overall risk of increase in aspiration because the lower esophageal sphincter tone is increased as well as the intra-abdominal pressure. So they both offset each other. Then we have the rise in the intraocular pressure, mainly due to the contraction of the extraocular muscles. And this can be as high as 10 millimeters of mercury and can last for as long as 10 minutes after the drug has been administered. Now clinically, we get worried about this when someone has a penetrating eye injury because there's risk of extrusion of the intraocular contents. However, there's no evidence that actually supports that the rate of this occurring is higher in giving people sucks versus a non-depolarizing drug like rock uranium. But certainly you'd be careful in someone that's had, say, a recent retinal detachment and that fixed. The other pressure that increases is our ICP, both due to the increase in cerebral activity and the stimulation of our muscle activity. Then in our mnemonic, we're up to K, which stands for potassium. So hyperkalemia is one of those things with succinimethonium that can kill someone. There's a transient rise with any succinimethonium dose of approximately 0.5 millimoles per liter. And this rise occurs because of the sustained muscle contraction, which leaks out potassium from the skeletal muscle. When we get especially worried is when we have the increase in our fetal 
nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Remember, those are the receptors that have a sustained long opening phase. So you get this huge outburst of potassium that can raise your plasma levels by nearly 3 to 5 millimoles. Giving sucks to a patient that's got chronic renal failure is not a contraindication, but you just need to be mindful of what their baseline potassium is. Then the next letter in our mnemonic is E, which stands for ectopic and arrhythmias. So typically, when you give sucks a methonium, it's going to have a small amount of effect on muscarinic receptors as well. This is more prominent in the pediatric population, where you see an associated bradycardia with a dose of sucks a methonium. Typically, these are big doses of sucks that you're giving to kids. And the typical arrhythmia is a junctional arrhythmia associated with that drug. To prevent this effect, you can give a pretreatment of atropine prior to giving the succimethonium. And if you're definitely giving a second dose of sucks to a patient, give that pretreatment. Finally, our last letter in our mnemonic is T for temperature. And this refers to the side effect of sucks causing malignant hypothermia. So if you cover all these points in your potential adverse effects of succimethonium, you're bound to get a pass mark. You just have to find a way that structures it well for yourself. The trick to this question is it seems very simple once you've gone through it, but when you give an adverse effect, give a mechanism for why that adverse effect occurs and a short statement about the treatment for that side effect. Now, there's no specific question that looks at the neuromuscular junction, and that last SAQ was the main one that I want to touch on with this mini pod. So we'll move on to the final part, which is looking at the viva stems. The question you should be asking is why do we go so in depth with the neuromuscular junction when there's no past SAQs about this topic? Well, that's because while there's no specific SAQs related to the neuromuscular junction, physiology of that neuromuscular junction always gets tied in when you talk about the neuromuscular drugs, whether that be rock, sucks, or just how acetylcholine works. And you have to know how those steps work from that pre-junctional nerve terminal to the post-junctional motor end plate and in between in the synaptic cleft. So as an example, a classic opening stem you can get are what type of receptors exist in the neuromuscular junction. Now your brain might go straight away to those acetylcholine receptors and you'll say there's pre-junctional and post-junctional acetylcholine receptors. Within that, there's adult type and fetal type, but that's just one part of the question. You have all those other receptors that you need to talk about. So within your pre-junctional nerve terminal, you have those voltage-gated calcium channels. In your post-junctional area, you have sodium potassium ATPase. And then perimotor end plate, you have those voltage-gated sodium channels. So a better answer for this opening viva stem might be there's a mix of receptors in the neuromuscular junction. These involve ion-gated ion channels, mainly pentameric channels, such as acetylcholine receptors. Additionally, there are also voltage-gated ion channels, located both presynaptically and postsynaptically. What this answer aims to do is show off your broad knowledge to the examiner, and then you can focus on the specifics of the acetylcholine receptors. Now, some might argue that a voltage-gated ion channel is not a receptor, because technically a receptor is defined as a protein-based moiety with a region where a ligand can bind. But I still think this way to answer a question shows off your knowledge in a much nicer way. The other classic opening viva question is what type of drug is succimethonium? Again, you don't want to be pulled into the specifics and say it's a non-competitive partial agonist. That just leaves you too vulnerable to explain terms like non-competitive what is a partial agonist way too early? You want to be broad and say it's a depolarizing muscle blocker, which has a chemical structure of a diacetylcholine, which is two acetylcholine molecules bound together. And it's an agonist drug at the post-junctional acetylcholine receptors within the neuromuscular junction. Again, giving that broad statement allows the examiner to lead you down the path in which they want to take the viva. Whenever someone's making a viva, you should always be asking yourself why are they asking you about this drug or why are they asking you about this concept. In my mind, there's two main reasons why someone asks you about a certain topic. The first reason is that topic is important to our core knowledge. And what I mean by that is that it's something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, such as giving patients IPPV or giving them a drug that we use like a muscle relaxant or... The second reason why they're asking about that viva 
is because there's something unique about that concept. Whether that's the drug that has unique pharmacokinetic properties, in this case, you know that succinamethonium can lead to a discussion about plasma colonisterases. It can also lead to a discussion about malignant hypothermia, or it can just lead to a discussion about the adverse effects of that drug. The last opening virus stem that relates to our topic today is simply just, what are the contraindications to succinamethonium? Or a variant of this would be, can you tell me some of the side effects of sucks? Again, a broad statement is what you need. Succinamethonium has many contraindications or many side effects, and these can be broken down into the effects on different systems. Or you can say that succinamethonium has many side effects, and these can be broken down into the most common, less common, and rare but fatal side effects. And again, all you're doing with these answers and these opening statements is working on a way that you can categorize all the thoughts in your head so the examiner knows what you're thinking and can lead you down a path. Now, I think that brings us to the end of today's mini pod, which has turned into a bit of a bigger pod than I had anticipated. And we've still only scratched the surface of neuromuscular junction physiology, neuromuscular blocking drugs, and we haven't even looked at the non-depolarizing agents yet. If there's one topic that I bet that will come up on every exam, either in a question format or in a viva format, it would be this. And the examiners want you to know so much detail about these drugs because they want to ensure that you're safe with these drugs. So with that said, I want to thank you all for listening to this mini pod. My next mini pod will be focusing on maternal physiology. If you haven't already, please follow me and subscribe to my YouTube page, Sweet Dreams Anesthesia, and check out the website. There's a lot of helpful tips for people now entering the Viva stage of the second setting of this year. And please subscribe to the podcast. You can find it on all the main platforms, Apple, Spotify, and even Amazon. And until next time, thanks for listening and good luck with your studying.